one of the most famous miracles of Jesus is when his disciples were caught in a storm on a boat in the middle of the night in a large lake. Jesus came out to them in the storm and literally walked all over the storm. He walked on water in the midst of a storm. This miracle was recorded by three of the four Gospel writers. But in this series on the Gospel according to Matthew, we would focus on Matthew's account. The interesting thing is that only Matthew added an account of what Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, did in response to Jesus. He basically said to Jesus, Me too, please. I'd like to walk on water too. What is the significance of this miracle for us today? Many people turn this story into a complex allegory or parable of discipleship in a way that shifts the emphasis away from Jesus and puts too much emphasis on Peter, or Peter as a representative of all the disciples of Jesus. Now, there are surely some lessons in discipleship here, but some people go too far and read too much into the story, thus ending up distorting it by making it teach things that it was never meant to teach, while not paying enough attention to what it is meant to teach. What I'm trying to do is put this story in its context. The context of the Gospels is about Jesus and who He is and what He says and what He does and why He came, His death, burial, and resurrection. In this context, what lessons could we learn from this miracle? We can find the account in Matthew chapter 14. If you have been reading the Gospel so far, you might remember Jesus was still mourning the murder of John the Baptist and seeking to be alone. But when Jesus saw a large crowd asking for his help, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. When it was getting dark, he even performed an amazing miracle of feeding those thousands of people by multiplying five loaves and two pieces of fish. After that, from verse 22 onwards, we are told that Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Meanwhile, a storm blew in, and the boat of the disciples was buffeted or battered by the waves and the wind. Now, you might remember that this had happened once before, in chapter 8. Back then, Jesus was in the boat with them. This time, Jesus is not with them. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. I would imagine by this time the disciples weren't worried about making it to the other side. They just wanted to stay alive. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Take a moment to let that scene sink in. The disciples were in distress, and the very person who was able to help them was approaching them. Only, he was not in the boat, and the disciples did not recognize him. Amazingly, being boatless didn't seem to slow Jesus down at all. But the disciples thought he was a ghost. They were afraid and cried out in fear. This is understandable. Who would expect that Jesus would come to them like that, right? They have already seen Jesus still the storm back in chapter 8. I mean, that was amazing. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? But Jesus has never done this. Jesus comes to them in the storm. Jesus walks on the storm. He literally walks all over the storm. The wind and the waves don't seem to affect him at all. He doesn't even need a boat to deal with the wind and the waves. He transcends everything that we have learned in physics class about laws of nature. It's as if the laws of physics don't apply to him. Who can do these kind of things if not God alone? And we read at the end of this passage in verse 33 that those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, you may have heard of or watched on TV illusionists or magicians who walked on water. Many years ago, I watched a video recording of the British illusionist Dynamo, whose real name is Stephen Frayne, apparently walked on the River Thames in front of the Houses of Parliament in London. But Dynamo never claimed to be divine, and he admitted that it's all done with elaborate preparation, technology, and a large crew of people. 
And this was not the first time he tried to do it either. The first time, it was all set up and ready to go, but then it rained heavily so that he had to cancel everything. In his book, he said that since early teen years, he has been suffering from an incurable chronic illness, which causes him pain every day. But he cannot heal the disease. When his beloved grandfather passed away a few years ago, Dynamo couldn't do anything to help him. Jesus didn't have any of the technology nor the crew which those illusionists have. And he walked on water in the midst of the storm, in the middle of the night. Plus, he said and did many things that only God could do, healing all kinds of diseases. And at the end of this chapter, in verses 34 to 36, he does that again. Elsewhere, we are told that he even raised people from the dead. And the most important miracle was his own resurrection from the dead. When we read about this miracle of Jesus walking on water, we are not only to say, wow, what a miracle, but also, wait, only God can control the sea. According to the Old Testament scriptures, God, and only God, has authority over the sea. That is why God was able to deliver his people through the Red Sea in Moses' days. Ever since those days, God's people had been waiting for God to send another one like Moses. Thus, this miracle in Matthew 14 tells us that Jesus is the one like Moses, even the one greater than Moses. He is the promised Messiah, the Christ, God's chosen King of the Kingdom of Heaven. As I explained in the previous sermon on Matthew 8, Jesus' power over the sea also shows His authority over the underworld. Please notice what Jesus said to them. Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Now, if you compare this text in its original language, you would notice that the words translated, it is I, is the same words that God spoke when He revealed Himself to Moses at the burning bush. Moses asked, what is your name? And God said to Moses, I am. To the prophet Isaiah, God said a few times, it is I, don't be afraid. All those are the same words Jesus spoke in Matthew 14. At the time when all this was happening, the disciples probably didn't fully understand what was going on. But after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, and after the Holy Spirit was given to them, they would have remembered this event and that Jesus said, It is I, don't be afraid. At least by then, the disciples would have connected the dots and realized that Jesus was revealing himself that night in a veiled way as God incarnate. Jesus gave us a glimpse of who he truly is, that he is Emmanuel, God with us, as the angel said to Joseph. Now, this miracle also gives us a glimpse of what Jesus is truly capable of. We know that Jesus was later crucified and died, but having seen this miracle, we know that his death on the cross was not caused by his lack of power or authority over his enemies. If he had wanted to use his power to avoid the crucifixion, he would have easily succeeded. How are you going to stop him? He can stop a storm and walk on water. The unfair trials, the strength and brutality of the Roman soldiers, the evil schemes of the Jewish leaders, the wooden cross, the nails, the crown of thorns, none of that would have been able to do anything to him, let alone kill him, if he had wanted to use his power. He could have just snapped his fingers and all his enemies would have turned to dust. But he didn't use his power to kill his enemies. He let himself be arrested, mocked, tortured, and killed on the cross. Why? As the angel said to Joseph, because he came to save his people from their sins. His death on the cross was a crucial part of God's gracious but audacious plan to save his people. As I said in the beginning, this miracle was recorded by Matthew, Mark, and John, but only Matthew added an account of what Peter did in response to Jesus. He replied, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Peter basically said to Jesus, Me too, please. I'd like to walk on water too. But before Peter gets out of the boat, he makes sure Jesus thinks it's a good idea. And there are different interpretations of what is going on with Peter here. Some people shift the emphasis away from Jesus and put too much emphasis on Peter, 
or Peter as a representative of all the disciples of Jesus, including us. For example, some suggested Jesus was walking on water that night in order to call his disciples to do something extraordinary, such as walking on water, like him. Therefore, this miracle is interpreted as if it were a parable or an allegory, an invitation to anyone who wants to step out in faith, anyone who wants to experience something more of the power and presence of God. But I'm not so sure that is a correct interpretation of this passage. I mean, surely God does invite or even challenge his disciples to trust in God's power and presence and take risks in his name, sometimes even to suffer and to die in his name. But I don't think that is what this passage is about. Let me explain why. Jesus didn't tell Peter to walk on water to begin with. It was sort of Peter's idea. He volunteers and makes a bold request to come to Jesus on the water. This is not a lesson on obedience. Peter wants to do it, and Jesus sort of acquiesces or accommodates Peter. So when Jesus says to Peter, come, it's not like I command you to come, and those who don't obey me will be punished later. Rather, it's more like, if you want to, come. It's going to be okay. Jesus gives consent to Peter's idea and goes along with his bold request. Some people interpret this passage as if Jesus were putting his disciples through a test of discipleship, giving them a lesson on risk-taking, almost like a dare, doing something extraordinary. As if Jesus were telling his disciples, if you want to experience something more of the power and presence of God, then step out of the boat and walk on the water with me. But Jesus never said anything like that. The power and presence of God was there that night for all the disciples to see and experience, whether or not they step out of the boat and walk on water. This story in Matthew 14 is not a lesson on risk-taking or higher Christian life. Jesus freely gives his presence and power to save them because he loves them and they need him. His presence and power is not something that they must earn by proving how brave they are. They didn't have to first get out of the boat and walk on water before he saves them. Many years ago, there was a bestseller book titled, If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat, written by John Ortberg. He interpreted walking on water as a metaphor of living on a higher plane of Christian life. Peter represented all the disciples of Jesus who realized there is more to life than sitting in the boat, who realized that they were made for something more than merely avoiding failure. Ortberg portrayed walk on water as this adventure of your life, an opportunity to leave the comfort of routine existence and abandon yourself to the high adventure of following God. But you see, the boat in Matthew 14 cannot possibly be a metaphor for our comfort zone of routine existence. The boat was anything but safe, secure, and comfortable. Before Jesus came that night, they were terrified because of the storm. If Jesus had not come, their life would probably have been in danger, even if they had stayed in that boat. Ortberg wrote a whole book based on the same story in Matthew 14, and it became a bestseller. Now, please don't get me wrong, I still found a lot of helpful things to learn in the book, but sometimes it's as if he was trying to do too much with his story. Sometimes he made the story teach things that it was never meant to teach. We must never lose sight of the fact that Jesus was there that night to save his disciples from the storm. This miracle does show his authority over the forces of nature, but he was not doing it to show off. Jesus walked on water only once. He never did it again. I mean, he could have done it again and again. Just think about it. A man who could walk on water did it only once? What self-restraint? Why not do it every day to convince people of what he is capable of and just how powerful he is? But as I said in another sermon on Matthew 11, Jesus is the gentle and humble God Most High. He walked on water that night mainly because his disciples needed to be saved from the storm. As simple as that. But Jesus is no one-trick pony. 
he never saves nor heals people in the exact same way. Back in chapter 8, Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves, and now he walks on water. Now before I go on, can I please remind you that if you find this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe button and share it with other people so that they can also benefit from it. What about Peter's request to come to Jesus on water? Please note that when Peter began to sink, Jesus needed only reach out his hand to catch him, which implies Peter had walked almost all the way. It must have been quite an experience. Yet the next thing he knew, when he saw the wind, he got afraid and began to sink. He cried out for Jesus to save him and got rebuked by Jesus for having little faith. Again, many people praised Peter here for trying. Mark Driscoll says, okay, he began to sink, but little faith is better than no faith. People say, he's still a winner. The other disciples who stayed in the boat are the losers. But that's not what Jesus says. He didn't pat Peter on the back saying, well done for giving it a go. No, rather he says to Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I suppose Jesus knew Peter better than we do, and even better than Peter knew himself. Jesus knew how best to deal with Peter. He didn't need a pat on the back. What he needed to do is to trust Jesus more and not doubt. Please notice also that Jesus never rebuked nor criticized the other disciples for not walking on water. He knew them all, and he didn't expect them to be Peter. Peter is Peter. The other disciples didn't need to be Peter. They were to have many other opportunities to learn to trust in Jesus, and it's not by walking on the water. At the end of the day, Jesus did not train his disciples to walk on water, but to trust in him, to obey him, to preach the gospel, and to make disciples of all nations. The portrayal of Peter here is consistent with the rest of Matthew's gospel. A couple of chapters after this miracle, Peter said something so profoundly true about Jesus that Jesus blessed him. But then he said something so wrong that Jesus called him Satan. In chapter 26, Peter says to Jesus, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And Jesus said, Peter would disown him. But Peter would have none of that. And when Jesus was arrested, Peter followed him all the way to the courtyard of the high priest. But in the end, he did disown Jesus, just as Jesus predicted. It's similar with Matthew 14. First, Peter does something really brave, but then he got rebuked for having little faith. In the video series, In Pursuit of Peter, the Apostle, New Testament scholar Con Campbell said that Peter is portrayed in the Gospels as someone who was a hothead, impulsive, stubborn, but he is very eager and very committed to Jesus, although it took him some time to work out who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. Campbell said, Peter helps us to see through our own failures. But the failure is not that we don't get out of the boat and walk on water. Rather, the failure is to not trust Jesus when Jesus says it's going to be okay. Even Peter fails to exercise faith, to trust Jesus. Even Peter cannot do it. He is too flawed. And if Peter cannot do it, then neither can you, neither can I. We are too weak. We are too flawed. It's a very humbling lesson. We tend to think that we are able to turn to Jesus and to be his disciples as it suits us. We will come to him as when we choose, as we want, and we will join his church at the moment that we decide. But this story shows us that we can only do things as Jesus enables us to be and to do. Apart from Jesus, the moment we forget Jesus or doubt him, we would fail, just as Peter did. But at the same time, this story is also wonderfully encouraging, because even in Peter's failures, Jesus doesn't abandon him. Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out and graciously saved him. How encouraging it is to read this in the midst of this prolonged lockdown. We might feel isolated and overwhelmed by it all. Look at Peter. Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out and graciously saved him. You cry out to Jesus, keep trusting Jesus, and he will reach out, and he will not let you go. 
Notice in verse 32, when Jesus climbed into the boat, the wind died down. That is another amazing miracle, isn't it? Often we focus on Jesus walking on water and Peter's attempt to do the same, that we ignore the miracle that Jesus didn't even need to say anything this time for the wind and the waves to calm down. His power and authority is so great that he not only can walk on water in the storm, and he not only can enable Peter to do the same, but that he can save his people from our enemy, and ultimately even from our sins and death even when we put our faith in Jesus and still suffer and even lose our lives because of our faith, Jesus is able and will save us from death in due time. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <music>